In case you didn't know, you were, if you were expecting um, Shafali Jeste to be here, she couldn't make it. Um, this is a talk largely put together by her, um, and we've uh, we've discussed extensively. Um, and in case you don't know Shafali, and um, this is Shafali, she's a spectacular clinician and scientist. And if you don't know the difference between a Shafali and a Harley, that is <laughs> what. This talk is, um, is there a point to, pointer? Yes. Is yeah. this the pointer? Yeah. Holy, okay. Um, so this talk is largely clinical. It's not primarily, it's not primarily re research talk. This is Los Angeles, so I made a movie. I will show the movie later. I'll tell you a little bit about the star of the movie, but I don't want to give it away so that I keep you awake. Okay, so we're gonna go over some of the features um, things that we do clinically, and I see a number of um, kids with autism um, who come into the clinic either for an initial evaluation or for, um, as Dan mentioned, uh, concomitant epilepsy. Um, all right, so talk a little bit about the genetics um, and what we actually do. Um, some about epilepsy, a um, uh, little bit about a couple of the real common issues, insomnia, and GI issues, and I don't claim a deep expertise in these areas, but um, but know a little bit. And Shafali knows a great deal and has and has helped me with this. Okay, so the the genetics of autism is the history of genetics itself, um, and and Dan is is really pioneered the idea that autism is a largely genetic uh, disorder. And people have been studying genetics and autism for a number of years using different methods. And I think you guys have handouts. Um, and so, so this just shows a progression of genetic methods. And this is in, in a, a little more uh, easily seen. So in the beginning, there, um, we did uh, karyotyping. That is where you, where you look at the chromosomes, see these bands. And in some cases, you would see these large chromosomal abnormalities. But that was, that was the rare, rarity. Um, then what was called the chromosomal microarray was developed and, um, and used extensively and found what's called copy number variants, where you see bits, and, bits of genes, but significant chunks of genes, where there's either more of them or less of them in cases of autism. And that's up to 20% up of cases, and I apologize if these statistics aren't 100% uh, accurate. And then subsequently, that's moved on to whole exome sequencing, and now there's a move in whole genome sequencing, where you're looking at the, the genes themselves and looking for more detailed abnormalities. And more than 700 causative genes are being identified. We've been involved in a very small aspect of that work. And so, so as we're, we're building more and more information, you're going to find that a larger percentage of children will have an identified causative genetic variant. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't environmental con contributors, but genetic contributors um, are going to be found in a large proportion of autism. And I think as the testing gets better, those percentages are going to increase. Um, there, have been, there are some recommendations of testing. This is in detail. I don't necessarily ascribe to all of these things. But, um, but basically, when we come in, when a child comes in, there's very few screening tests that we do in a child with a presumptive diagnosis of autism. Um, but genetic testing is a validated, cost-effective means um, to work up a child with autism. Um, we do chromosomal microarray to look for those copy number variants. We do um, fragile X testing in boys and MECP2 testing, that's the RETS gene, in girls. Um, there's some people who also, in, in some cases, do MECP2 testing in boys. Um, the testing should really be accompanied by genetic counseling. This is beneficial if the tests are either positive or negative. So some people say, oh, there's a negative test, so there's no need for genetic counseling. But, uh, but I think there's, there's plenty of need to say, what is the risk of an, of an additional sibling of, of my next child? And, um, and there's rough numbers that can be given, so genetic counseling has, has a, a, a real important role. So a lot of times um, I get challenged um, by parents, rightfully so, and by my colleagues. Why do it? Why do genetic testing? Are we gonna change anything? Is it gonna mean anything? 
And, um, and I, I, or I don't know if the number of you are parents. Um, your parent, you want to know the answer. But let's, let's talk a, a little bit more. So remember that autism is not a disease, but a syndrome. It's a, it's a group of characteristics. And it's impossible to predict what's going to happen to any one particular child without knowing a little bit more. So getting a genetic diagnosis may, and I say may, help us with that um, to, to a, a significant extent. Family counseling. Obviously, an understanding of the genetics can help you predict for future pregnancies um, and siblings and in other members of the family, depending on what's found. And Dan, Dan is, is, is a lot more of an expert on this than I am. What about treatment? Can getting a genetic diagnosis influence uh, treatment? And there are certain syndromes where there are, where there are specific treatments for certain, for instance, in some of the genetic causes where there's epilepsy um, and some other things that we'll talk about where there are specific causes, but that been more and more being found. But also there are certain comorbid comorbidities that are found with certain genetic disorders. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Research. So as the world goes forward in autism and in designing clinical trials, um, they, clinical trials will need to be informed by the genetics. I think that in a lot of cases, it's not going to be good enough to just say, I have 50 kids with autism, because all you guys know, that means that you have 50 different disorders. And so the genetics will help inform the clinical trials. And this, to me, as a child neurologist, is a big thing. I'm often the third or fourth and sometimes fifth doctor to see and evaluate a child. Helping, getting the genetic causes can often stop the long, painful search for other causes. OK. This is for memorization. Um, and uh, these are just some of the syndromes that have been uh, associated with autism. We could do the whole 45 minutes is it, um, on, on just listing all of these. Um, but just so you know that, that, that research is building and more and more things are being identified. So what the, another point in getting a diagnosis is working backwards. That is, you may have a kid who presents primarily with an autistic or neurologic phenotype. Um, and by phenotype, um, for these who don't understand, meaning, meaning the characteristics of that patient. Um, and then you do a genetic test and you say, whoa, this genetic syndrome or genetic mutation can be associated with other medical abnormalities that need attention. These are a few of them. Tuberous sclerosis is something that we, that, that we are a center for. We see quite a lot. Um, and it can be associated with heart, kidney, and other abnormalities, and some neoplasms, a rare disorder where uh, Dr. Martinez Agosto um, has expertise. is called the P10 hematoma syndrome. Kids with very large heads, um, get, uh, some of them have mutations in this gene and in related genes. And they can have multiple cancer types that you need to surveil for. for. And then another area uh, where there's expertise here extensively is in uh, 22Q syndrome, which can be associated with other particular metabolic abnormalities depending on the size of the deletion. That's just a few of these. So the more we know, the more that we can help the child in a global fashion. So this is uh, another slide of Shafali's, just saying that, that at UCLA, there's this uh, developmental neurogenetics clinic with Dr. Geste, Dr. Ba, uh, Dr. Uh, Martinez Agosto, um, that is a spectacular clinic where you have kids, you, often with identified genetic disorders, in a multidisciplinary team to treat those patients um, with psychologists, neurologists, psychiatrists, and that that feeds back into the research effort. And I think that that's a, a, a really great model. And I'm a, I'm a real fan of that clinic. So this is, this is the, the five minutes of, of research um, where the, the much anticipated for um, film preview will be coming up soon. So hang on to your hats. Um, so uh, and what has been learned by, by doing all these things, by discovering genetics and discovering causes, um, um, that's what the rest of the day is for. But as a general kind of thing is that there are, there are autism-associated genes that are the genes that I've been studying in the lab, but I didn't know I was studying autism. 
genes that build the brain, you get a brain that's built abnormally, and then that causes potentially the symptoms. But there's also genes that are involved in the way brain cells connect to each other. And this has led a um, number of people like Dr. Geshwin Levitt and um, Buchheimer to, to identify that there are some common features in autism. And that's the way different brain areas talk to each other. And that is kind of struck us. So we did the important things, which is not what's going on in humans, but what's going on in mice. And so this is a way that the human research, literally the research in humans, is informing us about what we do in mice that we then hope will inform us in clinic. So we're, so, so Dr. DiPretto and uh, Dr. Buchheimer do functional MRIs in humans. Pshaw, that's not a challenge. So my colleague Neil Harris is doing it in mice and showing that certain mice, mice with certain autism-like symptoms um, have these problems in connectivity. And so then we're looking, this is it guys. So then we look in mice for treatments that we then hope will translate to the clinic. So this is a mouse that, that is, is an autism-like mouse. And so it has excess grooming behavior. And, and my, um, my colleague Janelle LaBelle made the movie, but I made those titles in iMovie by myself. And so this mouse, every so instant, stops and grooms itself. And then we gave it a treatment um, based on what we knew that, about autism, the work of Alcino Silva and others. And then the mouse stopped groom, grooming itself. And so then, ultimately, what we do is hope to translate that using the resources here with Jim McCracken and Shafali to translate that into patients. OK. That, that was my, my movie. And, and I only have one more funny slide later in the, in the talk. So what about epilepsy? So we all know that there's an association of autism and epilepsy. And that's a lot of what we do here at UCLA in pediatric neurology. So epilepsy is, can be defined as more than one unprovoked seizure in a lifetime. And by provoked, meaning uh, a provoked seizure is something where you maybe someone got too much insulin and their blood sugar went down or they have a brain infection. Um, I'm more simplistic than Shafali, so I say it's the tendency to have seizures. Um, and so, so um, and it's diagnosed by clinical events primarily, and we use EEG <laughs> to help us with the diagnosis. And EEG is an important tool to us, not just because neurologists can bill for those, but because the way the pattern on the EEG leads us to specific treatments for those epilepsies. So the epidemiology of epilepsy and autism spectrum disorder um, is now being um, played out as we're diagnosing more kids, getting better di diagnoses. This is an estimate of approximately 20% of uh, epilepsy over the lifetime in an aut autism. The actual incidence of epilepsy in the quote unquote normal population is one to two percent. About five percent of people will have in their lifetime careers will have one, one seizure. Okay. Um, as we get longer experience in adults with autism, um, the uh, incidence of epilepsy can increase. This is my dear nephew. Um, I got permission from his mom. To, to show this picture. Um, he is 27 um, and a hipster. He's autistic, he's nonverbal. Um, and he had his first seizure a month ago, and he's had three seizures uh, sub subsequently. So the incidence of epilepsy, even though we say it increases with adolescence, um, it, can, it can present as an adult. And he was a classic uh, regressive autistic. Um, and actually, oh, my sister wanted wanted me to point out that, um, to tell you guys that anything is possible. This is him in a, in a drum line. He doesn't talk. He has uh, some comprehension of speech. Um, I, I told her that I was going to tell her to point out that people need razors, but, but I think her point, her point is better. Um, this is a more recent study in McHugh et al. Um, showing a little bit more detail about the incidence of epilepsy and autism. And one of the important points about this slide is that um, 
Seizure types can vary. For those of you who know about seizure types, seizures can be start in one area of the brain and be what's called um, partial onset. They can then spread to the rest of the brain where the classic generalized convulsion, or they can produce funny behaviors. And we used to think that autism was primarily, and it still is, primarily partial onset seizures or even multifocal seizures starting from multiple areas. But you can have generalized seizure disorders, even what's called the so-called classic petit mal or absence seizures in autistic children. And I have a few of those patients in, uh, in my practice. And there's also this. Um, for you general, how, how many general pediatricians are there? OK, so we spend, a, how, what do we teach you about febrile seizures? We spend a lot of time teaching you that febrile seizures have no implication for later development of epilepsy. Don't we do that? You kind of, why should I say, oh, don't worry about it. You don't need to worry. There's a statistical aberration that if you take all people with ep epilepsy, especially autistics with epilepsy, and look back on their history, there is a slightly higher than expected uh, percentage of people with febrile seizures. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I can't make it make too much sense. But in autism, and this study found that too, there's a higher incidence than expected of people who had uh, febrile seizures in those, as a child in those with autism. Seizures have meaning, okay? There's both this, the dramatic thing of the seizure itself, but there is also um, the issue that, that the more seizures there are, the closer the link is to intellectual disabilities, that seizures occur with greater frequency in those with identified syndromes or identified genetic mutations um, and more adapt poor adaptive function. Now, does that mean that the seizures themselves are causing the problems? It's not clear that that's the case or that in those syndromes, brain development was so um, abrupt or, or, or poor that seizures are also a necessary concomitant of those problems. So when we talk about seizures, we can also bring in the idea of regression. And that is something of a controversial topic in autism. And so, um, so there, we all see in our practices a number of kids who come in with the parental history of, that their child was talking and then stopped, right? And, um, and there's been some contention in the literature as to whether, OK, was this child ever truly normal? I can tell you with my nephew, he was speaking in full sentences at the age of two and was a bit of a savant. And then he stopped talking flat out a, a, few, month, a few months later. So, um, but, but whether they're typical, I think I still, that, that's a topic for other people. Um, but there's one issue related to regression and, and epilepsy. And that is that there are some kids, and we'll talk about those clinical features in a minute, who have a, who have a regression and are apparently autistic who have a regression that's related to epilepsy. And there's a variety of names for this. It's actually fairly rare, OK? Um, and it's called the Landau-Kleffner syndrome, named after doctors Landau and Kleffner. Um, and or acquired epileptic aphasia. It's a syndrome that is often associated with a nighttime EEG where during slow wave, slow wave sleep, there are constant epileptic or epileptiform activities. It's not a seizure per se, um, and that there is a correlation or relationship between this EEG pattern and their loss of speech. Almost always, we can tell the difference between a quote unquote typical autistic regression and someone who is likely to have this syndrome. So in autistic regression, you have the loss of language, um, you, you, relatively subtle, but it can be more than that. Um, regression affects social communication, repetitive behaviors and language, and EEG may be normal or may show a few, cent few occasional what we call spikes. In an epileptic regression, usually the onset is after the age of three. Usually there is a history of a couple seizures in that child, not always, 
but the child is otherwise normal, and then you have a sudden dramatic loss of language. Um, it, re regression primarily affects language. You can have a kid that seems pretty autistic in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of ways, and then we see these EEGs. The treatment is, is different. Um, uh, some kids will respond to anti-epileptics. We used to treat with high-dose prednisone, high-dose steroids, and now lately we're treating with very high-dose benzodiazepines, um, good old Valium. And, um, and what we do is when we find this pattern on EEG and the clinical syndrome fits, um, we bring them into hospital, we give them high-dose intravenous val Valium to see if the EEG gets better, and then put on a short course of high dose value, parents hate us. Uh, it, it's, it's like saying, telling your kid, hey, go down to the bar and have a bunch of shots of tequila every night. Um, but for some kids, it's miraculous, uh, uh, literally miraculous. Um, and um, occasionally, some kids actually respond to regular anti-epileptics and low-dose benzodiazepines. I have a, one girl who had a complete regression of Landau-Kleffner syndrome. And she, um, she just graduated, it, she stopped talking. It was unable to talk, unable to read, unable to anything. She just graduated with her PhD in um, speech and language therapy. And she got treated with a teeny tiny dose of an old drug called transine. So should we get an EEG on every autistic kid? The answer is no. It's neither cost effective nor beneficial to the patient. Um, oftentimes a slightly abnormal EEG leads to spurious treatments. Um, we do obtain prolonged sleep-deprived EEG if there's one, if there's evidence of clinical seizures, and if there's a history of significant developmental regression, especially in toddlers and preschoolers, and then this is the um, cover, cover it all. But there's also genetic syndromes that confer a high risk of epilepsy, like tuberous sclerosis. And that's a controversial topic as to whether you even, even with tuberous sclerosis, the epilepsy um, is so prevalent that some people are treating uh, prophylactically beforehand. In general, when we see seizures with autism, we treat the seizures as we would treat any other child or adult with epilepsy. We have a range of agents that we can use. Um, this is a very commonly used reagent, levetiracetam, because it has a very high safety profile, but it also can cause um, significant behavioral side effects. Now, I told that to my sister because their neurologist put my, my, um, my nephew on levetiracetam, which is uh, the, gener the trade name is often called Kepa. Um, but, um, and I told her, warn her about all the behavioral side effects. His behavior is better, so, um, so much for me. Um, and there are a number of other agents. In general, unless it's, there's a very specific localized onset, we use what we call broad spectrum anti-epileptic drugs. So Dan, was that you turning off my talk? Okay, so insomnia, big issue, right? I mean, you, you, you guys all, all know that, not just for presenters at talks, but particularly children with ASD. Okay, this is my slide on the biology of sleep. I don't know much about the biology of sleep, but there are intrinsic brain mechanisms that regulate sleep. We all have clocks in our brain. Actually, we have clocks in all of our cells. Um, and those clocks regulate in a cyclical fashion various neurotransmitters and hormones such as melatonin. But as we also all know, there are a lot of environmental causes um, to ins insomnia, and so all of these need to be thought of. Um, so insomnia occurs in up to 80% of children with ASD. I always say that means that they weren't, um, can you hear me now? That they, that, that they weren't checking on the other 20%. Um, and this can be a variety of causes. There can be difficulty getting to sleep. Can, can you guys hear me, or should I use the mic in the back? We need the mic. Please. Okay. So um, a lot of kids have frequent night awakenings or fragmented sleep. They'll have early morning awakenings. I mean, how many parents do you guys have coming into the office and say, okay, I'm 
five in the morning and my kids staring at me um, in bed. Uh, there's, a de there's a thought that in a lot of kids, in a number of patients' minds, there's actually a decreased need for sleep. This is uncommon in pediatrics. Most of the time in pediatrics where someone comes in and says, my kid has insomnia, they are making up for it during nap with naps in the day. A number of kids with ASD don't do that. And of course, um, as all neurologists have, daytime sleepiness and irritability. So how do you diagnose, what do we do to work up sleep impairment? Well, this is the old way, um, and it's still something you use, polysomnography. Um, and, and a lot of you can imagine getting some of your autistic patients and children into this in a hospital or in a, in, in the, actually the rooms are pretty nice now. Um, overnight, you have this thing to read out CO2, you have an EEG leads on, you have this to look at, look at breathing, you have writing under you. Um, but um, it, what Shafali pointed out is that there are actually a number of questionnaires that can be used. There's this questionnaire, which is um, a little longer, uh, primarily um, a research tool um, with 45 items. You're not going to do that in your 10-minute um, office follow-up visit. But there's this, uh, family inventory of sleep habits, um, which is a very simple inventory. And, and um, you know, went on, online and looked at it, uh, which can be quite useful. Children with, in, uh, who do have um, significant sleep impairment have more comorbid comorbid behavioral and cognitive disturbances. Um, poor sleepers generally of younger age. Um, they're more hypersensitive, hypersensitivity. You, obviously, you see more co-sleeping with parents, a, a number of these things. And the, those who actually can sleep, the few that, that sleep better, are actually doing better. And again, it's a chicken and egg thing um, as, as to what, what causes what. Okay, so there are probably in ASD biological mechanisms that cause sleep impairment as well as very significant behavioral mechanisms. The, the children can ignore environmental cues that help um, entrain the sleep-wake cycle and circadian rhythm. They can perseverate on activities or thoughts that interfere with sleep onset. And that should be an obvious one, right? They, they, they want to be doing other things or they just can't stop doing other things. Um, Limitations in communications also limit in how you can prepare a child for sleep. And then um, other things like hypersensitivities, textures, they don't like the sheets, they don't, a, a, a number of things. So what do you do? So really all children with ASD should be screened in some way for insomnia. These are actually some simple, simple questions. Do they fall asleep within 20 minutes? Do they fall asleep primarily in the parent's bed? Do they sleep too little? Do they awaken during the night? And those should alert you for issues. Um, you need to look for other medical conditions um, that use pediatricians all know about, enlarged tonsils that may be causing obstructive sleep apnea, and a, and a number, number of other things. And then this is a key. Is, do they need therapeutic intervention, and do they need further workup? So, we can talk about this, and I'll talk, you, talk to you about therapeutic intervention um, in a minute, but that's, there's a rub, right, is, is, get, is, is dealing with this and how to deal with it. Um, sleep specialists um, are available. They exist. Um, but um, but so you, at some point, you may want to go back to the polysomnography, especially if you see some, some of these things, um, and, and do, that, do that study. So how do you intervene? This is a um, website. I don't, I don't think I got this in, in, uh, in your handouts. If you go to the autismspeaks.org uh, site, you will um, be able to link, just put in sleep, and, and you'll get this. Very useful. Okay? Um, and this goes through some of the strategies. Some of the, a lot of it's behavioral, um, and the things that you guys all know about for, for anybody. And, and routine is a big, big one. And then exercise and activities during the day are another big one. There's charts at that website um, that says that in a nonverbal child, you can go through what their expectations are. And as you guys know, with kids with ASD and a number of disorders, routine is, um, is really, really important. Um, and there's other tips. You want to get them off the screens. 
um, at, at night. That's good for you guys too. Um, exercise during the day, stick to a schedule, and caffeine, um, you know, most in, on the west side of LA, uh, people, people are aware of this, but, but not always. And then there's behavior modifications, there are bedtime passes, um, and the website goes into that a bit more. If behavioral intervention doesn't work, there are some pharmacologic approaches. Um, melatonin can be useful. Um, in those children, especially that have trouble falling asleep. It's not really that useful for maintaining um, good sleep. Um, often melatonin is underdosed. Um, so Dr. Jeste recommends a minimum of five milligrams. Um, and and that, that seems, to be, seems to have some efficacy. It's been proven to be, be effective. This is a melatonin receptor agonist. Their case reports, I have never used it. I just have no experience with it. So when you, when you ask the ex experts, you can, you can cross me out as an expert on this drug. This is just to show you that there are as many melatonin preparations as there are children with autism. And this is kind of funny. You should probably put this in. I lied. This is, this is kind of a funny slide. Um, this, this melatonin is same maker, three milligrams, Five milligrams. This is the extra strength. Um, so, the, the there's a whole bunch of preparations. To be honest, I tell I, I have my um, patients go get it at one of the large chains. Um, you guys all know that there's a big scandal with some natural remedies, homeopathic remedies, for instance, where they're finding in homeopathic sleep aids Benadryl. Um, and in finding in homeopathic remedies for ADHD um, uh, stimulants. So, so you want to be careful uh, with the manufacturers. Um, for some kids, melatonin makes them feel um, anxious. Um, so you just have to try. And also kids with severe intractable epilepsy, even though we use it, um, there's a theoretical risk of an increase in seizures. These are some off-label um, uh, pharmacologic treatments that people have tried. Um, clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist. It's, it's a drug used um, commonly. It's, it was marketed as an antihypertensive. It has some efficacy in attention deficit disorder. And it can improve um, both sleep latency and, and decrease the number of nighttime awakenings. The risk there is that if someone's on it chronically, you can't abruptly start, stop it. Gabapentin, it seems to be used for everything, um, can, make, can make you drowsy. Benzodiazepines I really try to avoid. Um, yeah, because um, there, there's daytime sleepiness and there can be behavioral, uh, real behavioral problems. This is a very intriguing area, iron supplementation. This came from the literature in restless leg syndrome, um, showing that iron supplementation has some efficacy in that. And there's a tenuous link in some cases of ASD and uh, restless leg syndrome in family members. Um, okay. So let's talk about the, the last issue is one of the more controversial issues, the, the GI issues in diet. The fact that autistic kids have GI issues has been known for a number of years. Um, they, there'll be chronic constipation, diet, uh, irritable and inflammatory bowel conditions. Um, there'll be uh, reflux, food intolerance, allergies. The CDC says children, kids with ASD are 3.5 more likely to suffer from constipation and diarrhea than typically developing children. Um, those of you who have autistic patients that don't have some GI problems, please let me know. Um, the link, and there is some link between the severity of GI symptoms and the severity of autism. Okay, this is what you really want to talk about. Okay, so the GI symptoms themselves, so, so people have gone to um, to, to try and address these, these, uh, these diets, gluten-free, casein-free um, diet. So then people say, well, there's, there are rare instances of inborn errors of metabolism where gluten, there is gluten sensitivity and it can worsen symptoms. So that gets generalized. And so there's a large percentage of parents that wish to do this, um, this diet not just for the gastrointestinal problems, but for the autism symptoms. And there are no good data to support that, to be, to be honest. Okay, we'll talk about kind of how, what we recommend uh, regarding this. Okay, 
you also, once you start restricting the diet, then you have to be careful because, um, I mean, a lot of autistic kids are self-restricted in their diet. You know, yellow foods or, or foods with certain textures or some things like that. And so if you're restricting even more, you want to be a little bit, a little bit careful um, about actual deficiencies. And the summary of, of the recommendations, um, this is for, from uh, uh, Peds in Review, is that there's no support for using this diet for autism symptoms. But, but if a parent is motivated to, to do that, um, you should be aware of that. And there's actually, if you walk, if you go to, any market in west of um, kind of I-5, you will have uh, an aisle so long of gluten-free items, it's not that onerous of a, thing, of a thing to do. And what about probiotics, right? So that's, that's a big, big thing now. Should we be on Jamie Lee Curtis, where I watch the commercial and it fixes everything? So probiotics, there is some basis for thinking of probiotics in relation to autism. There's good science to say that the gut microbiome can influence the central nervous system. Having said that, we don't know what to do, right? So there are all these agents, and again, look at the prices of some, some of these. It's 125 bucks um, for that, whatever, whatever it is. There are a number of putative probiotic agents. Um, again, we don't know what even has a possibility of work. If you do use something, what, we, what most people recommend is choose one with only one strain of bacteria that is simple, often it's, it's a yogurt, and try it and see, see what you think. Anyone who says, I know exactly which organisms to use and which probiotics to use, is, is not speaking from scientific background. So these are some of the take home points. I'm wrapping up after my two hour talk. So in genetics, all children with ASD should undergo genetic testing um, and, and this can help guide prognosis, screening and possibly treatments. Epilepsy, seizures are more common in children with ASD, especially in adolescents and maybe beyond. But EEG is only indicated if there's a clinical concern or the risk category is high. Sleep, do it. Um, oh, okay. All children with ASD should be screened for insomnia and if their concerns um, should be guided and, and behavioral management really can, can work. GI issues are very common and re may require both behavioral and medical management and there's limited data on, on, these, on these diets. Also, the last thing I want to say is that the natural history of autism is not known. And this is because autism is a whole variety of syndromes and that children even within a given syndrome can fluctuate in their symptom severity. It is so common. We all have the tendency we do something and then the child gets better. And so it's natural to say that what we did caused the improvement. So always be careful about determining cause and effect. And I want to thank you for your attention um, and for watching my uh, premiere of my movie. Um, and uh, and this, this is some informa information um, and, and some of the uh, services, um, and I recommend you look into the uh, neurogenetics clinic as, uh, as appropriate. Thanks.